Good evening everyone, time for another member update. Now we just got a big smackdown happening right now in the after hours. This is a one minute chart so you can see the volume there. Really, really big volume trying to break down into new lows. You can see it was met by quite a bit of buying. Uh, we'll see that's bigger than anything we've had for the last three days. Let's pull it out to the 10 minutes. Uh, it's a pretty big move, 350,000 whatever they are. Uh, I don't think they're contracts, but we don't know. Let's take a look at gold. Pretty big action going on in gold as well. So a big smackdown after hours, and gold, again, is, uh, is lagging. Silver, you can see silver's already completely bounced back. So these latest moves, silver's actually been stronger. It's almost like silver can't really go much lower it, it's really already ridiculous and absurd how low the price is uh, you know when you look at the cost of mining uh, all in costs other things like that i don't think gold is nearly as underpriced in regards to those costs as silver is and i showed you before the the silver mining companies that are nearly going bankrupt so I wanted to show you, before we get to the main story, I'm going to talk about South Africa, but before we do that, I want to uh, take you over to the Silver Eagles, and you can see here that the now we're still in that period of time when the Mint is not selling them, but they still have them. So here's Atmex, this is the 2015 Silver Eagle, and it looks like they have unlimited quantities of those. So you, uh, what I wanted to do is compare the pricing here. You can see that it's uh, at 359 over spot. So that's 1831 per coin. And then I wanted to take you over and show you the Wayback Machine. Now, what I did was I, uh, what I wanted to find actually was the time frame of around here. April, actually May 18th, when we were about three bucks higher, because I wanted to do a comparison of, see if the difference is $3. I know it's not going to be, but I wanted to see how big the difference is. Unfortunately, we couldn't get that, because you can see here, very strangely, the Wayback Machine actually only has one capture of the 2015 uh, American Eagle and that's from April 15th. So we'll just have to use that one. We don't have any choice. So you can see back in April 15th, here's the price of silver here, 1609. And you can see where we're at now, 1472. The price of the Silver Eagle was 1888. And right now we're at 1831. So you got a dollar to dollar fifty difference in the price, but only a fifty cent difference in the price of the Silver Eagle. That's another example of when the price of silver gets too low, the premiums make up the difference. So obviously when you see this happening, you're gonna to want to avoid the coins that are getting premium increases that you know, you're not getting the benefit of the price drop. Even though the price is dropping, you're not seeing the price on the things you wanna buy drop. So you wanna find coins that participate in the price drop so you can get that take advantage of that low price but at the same time you don't want to buy coins that aren't going to run up in price when the price runs back up and that's why i said i personally avoid things like 10 ounce 100 ounce bars rounds and things like that because they're always just like a buck above spot price whereas if you can find semi numis that are say two or three bucks above spot price when they're in the current year, but then later on they appreciate significantly. Of course, you know, my favorite Perth series, Lunar, Perth Lunar series. But uh, so those are pretty high priced. I don't have a way of checking to see how much they've come down. I didn't check them on the way back, but I suspect that they've come down even less. So the other day I was looking at the elephants there may be some others, but 
it's hard to balance that. You want to get one that's going to appreciate semi new me when the price goes back up, but it also has to be a coin that is participating in this drop when the premiums are not expanding. So that's that's a hard thing to do. You have to watch it very closely. Um, are we going to go lower tonight? I don't know. This is a pretty big move in volume. This might be some kind of test bottom that they put in. You can see when we go back to that spike that we had back in, we'll have to go to the eight hour. This one here, this one that you didn't get to trade at all on very low volume, very fast. You can see we're trading through those prices now, but we haven't had that test of that 1440. That's the price we're looking at, 1440 low. That's the one we touched and you can see we got to 1448. So they got very close to testing it and then huge buying came in. So let's get to the main story here. I'm gonna talk about South Africa, but I want to start off by talking about Zimbabwe. Now, I've talked about the lunatic Maduro in Venezuela and the nutcase Cristina Fernandez in Argentina, but those don't even compare to this madman, this psychopath, communist lunatic, Robert Mugabe. And the things that he's done in Zimbabwe, I don't think the tale can even be told, but basically it's genocide. He pretty much gave his political cronies uh, the right to kill whites and take their land. That's pretty much what it amounted to, although they would never admit that. But some surprising admissions do come out here, very amazing admissions that we actually have. Believe it or not, in Zimbabwe, they actually uh, practice a type of reverse apartheid where whites actually have less rights than blacks. It's just insane. But that's the left. That's communism. They're very, very dangerous, murderous people. So let's read some of this. File this one away in When Populism Backs Fires folder. A little over a month after announcing that the Zimbabwean dollar, which you're reminded was phased out in 2009 after inflation rose modestly to 500 billion percent, would be demonetized and exchanged at a generous rate of $5 for every 175 quadrillion Zimbabwe will for the first time rethink the sweeping land grabs which began in 2000 and subsequently crippled the country's economy. Many Zimbabwean farmers who have stopped growing food in favor of green gold tobacco fear they will starve this winter after severe drought and generalized lack of knowledge left them with a subpar crop that fetched little at auction. Here's more from Reuters. Thousands of small-scale farmers in Zimbabwe fear they will be going hungry this winter after abandoning traditional staples like maize, sorghum, and ground nuts for tobacco, a cash crop known locally in this southern African nation as green gold. For 15 years after Zimbabwe's agricultural sector collapsed in the face of President Robert Mugabe's seizure of white-owned farms to resettle landless blacks, the tobacco industry has been booming with farmers funded by private firms to grow tobacco. But this switch, coupled with the worst regional drought in nearly a decade, has left Zimbabwe in a precarious food situation. Many farmers have complained of low prices as the season ends, while buyers argue the quality of the crop was poor. The tobacco industry has become the country's biggest export earner with over 88,000 growers registered with the tobacco regulatory body, the Tobacco Industry and Marketing Board, in the 2014-15 season, up from 52,000 in 2012. But the returns are often uncertain and many farmers have been left disappointed. Industry figures showed that at the end of selling season this month, farmers sold 188.5 million kilograms worth $555 million, down 8.5% from a year ago when the crop was worth $654 million. Quote, it was a disaster, said David Moyombo, 35, a father of four, who earned $74 from tobacco sales this season after investing $1,200 in his crop. Quote, I need to buy food for my family and I have no money. Moyombo blames his failure on erratic rains, which decimated his crop, as well as his lack of knowledge on how to apply fertilizer, remove suckers, and cure the crop. Moyambo said he will never farm tobacco again. 
with more farmers focused on tobacco, Zimbabwe's harvest of maize, a staple food, dropped by 49% in the 2014-15 season, the government said, which set to exacerbate food shortages in Zimbabwe once the breadbasket of the region. That's correct. That before they basically committed genocide on the white farmers, that was actually the country that fed all of Southern Africa. Against this rather dreary backdrop, the government is beginning to reconsider its stance toward white farmers and will, according to the Telegraph, give official permission for some whites to stay on the land, on their land, via the Telegraph. Zimbabwe's government has for the first time suggested it may give official permission for some white farmers to stay on their land 15 years after it sanctioned widespread land grabs that plummeted the country into an economic crisis. Douglas Mombashora, the ZANU PF, and this is the communist murderers there, lands minister said provincial leaders had been asked to draw up a list of white farmers they wanted to stay on their farms deemed to be of strategic economic importance. Quote, we have asked provinces to give us the names of white farmers they want to remain on farms so that we can give them security of tenure documents to enable them to plan their operations properly, Mr. Mombashoro said more than 4,000 white farmers lost their land after Mr. Mugabe lost a referendum to the New Movement for Democratic Change Party. Sound familiar? And in a bid to regain popularity, authorized land grabs by disaffected war veterans. Today, fewer than 300 white farmers remain on portions of their land holdings in Zimbabwe, and many of the seized farms lie fallow meaning the former breadbasket of Africa has to import food to feed its population. Among remaining farmers who have been recommended for a reprieve of Mr. Mugabe's edict that whites can no longer own land in Zimbabwe is Elizabeth Mitchell, a poultry farmer who produces 100,000-day-old chicks each week. And so, once again, we see that necessity of food shortage breeds invention, rethinking populist land grabs, but lest anyone should believe that Mugabe has done a complete 180, we'll close with the following advice given to supporters at a recent patriotic front rally. Quote, don't be too kind to white farmers. They can own industries and companies or stay in apartments in our towns, but they cannot own land. They must leave the land to blacks. So there you go. In this day and age, we have reverse apartheid by the communist psychopath dictator Robert Mugabe. Do you hear anything about that in the news? No, you don't, and you never will. Now here's another article demonstrating that. This is back from 2013. Zimbabwe to open a blacks-only stock exchange. Zimbabwe's regime has promised to open a new and racially exclusive stock exchange, allowing blacks alone to trade shares from seized foreign companies. The plan to grab mining companies, most of which are South African owned, now this is where we get to South Africa, followed President Robert Mugabe's landslide re-election last week. Savior Kasa Kuwari, the indigenization minister, said on Tuesday that the government or, or black Zimbabweans would take 51% of the shares in all major foreign-owned companies. That sounds very much like what Chavez did in Venezuela, and the oil companies pulled out, the oil industry collapsed, and now Venezuela actually has to import oil. Valued at about 4.8 billion pounds, no compensation will be paid. The regime wants to control mining companies, and in particular Zimplatz, a major platinum producer which is largely owned by South Africa's Impala Platinum Holdings. Mr. Kasu Kawuri said that mining companies which do not cede 51% of their shares to black Zimbabweans or the state would risk losing their operating licenses. He said the value of the natural resources or underground metals extracted by the companies were sufficient to pay for majority shareholdings. So, that's what's going on in Zimbabwe. Now, I personally believe that that same thing is coming to South Africa. And I believe it will start with a white genocide, which I think is all, already started partway. And then it's going to spread to their industries. And then I believe that South Africa will collapse the same way that Zimbabwe did. Now, let's look at this 
article from Andy Hoffman back in 2013. It's called The Rise and Fall of South African Mining. I found this article because I was looking for South African mining, uh, gold mining production, and you can see the dramatic drop. Uh, it's kind of interesting here because I don't know what the date when apartheid was overthrown in South Africa, but I believe it was back in here. And you can see from that point, now don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that apartheid was good, but I'm certainly not saying that the communists that took over and put burning tires around their opponents are good either. But you can see under the communists that the mining has just collapsed. So let's read this a little bit of this. Aside from the massively PM bullish factor of limitless central bank printing money, I've continually harped on the fact Evidence points to gold and silver marginal cost of production approaching $1,500 an ounce and $30 an ounce, respectively. GFMS says 2012 gold mining cash costs increased 17%, the most ever, thus preventing production from meaningfully, meaningfully increasing. Gold production is declining. Silver production in the U.S. declines 8.7%. Naked shorting of hapless mining shares has further reduced miners' ability to rest inexorable production, declines, and counter-surging costs. And I strongly urge you to enhance the deleterious unintended consequences of this nefarious cartel scheme by selling miners and destroying the cartel. So he was right on that one. I've said the same thing. In many cases, this is already occurring, but no place more than South Africa. South Africa mining to shed jobs in troubled times where gold production just hit a 90-year low. South African gold production dives again to 90-year lows, down 50% since the PM bull commenced in 2000. For decades, South Africa was the undisputed gold mining king, cumulatively responsible for 50% of all gold ever mined. However, just as the energy industry witnessed 10 years ago, the low-hanging fruit has been picked clean, yield, yielding surging mining costs. South Africa faces mining dilemma as costs soar, particularly in South Africa, where most remaining reserves are way below the surface, in some cases by up to two and a half miles. Moreover, the nation faces horrific electricity shortage. Now, why is that? That's because of the communists that are in power. Adding to mining costs, Eskom Holdings, which supplies about 95% of South Africa's power, is seeking 16% average annual tariff increase until 2018 to fund expansion. And chronic labor issues. South Africa Zuma equate, equates mine closure plants with blackmail. That's Jacob Zuma. That's the communist psychopath that runs South Africa, prompting massive layoffs and unemployment and financial losses. Thus, it should be no surprise that the historical bulwark of global gold production has been driven into obscurity, never to be replaced. Ironically, the U.S. Geological Service, in its last such report in 2009, still lists South Africa as holding more than 30% of the world's known reserve base, while the world's current leading producer, China, doesn't even make the list. Now, what does that tell you? You think China is going to take over in South Africa? I think so, after that collapses, and uh, that's probably going to be pretty soon. The rise and fall of South African mining should serve as a lesson to those believing peak gold is not possible, let alone peak silver. Artificial price suppression is taking its toll on PM production in general. However, natural decline is equally debilitating, particularly given the variable explosion in physical demand. So that's uh, from Andy Hoffman. So it's my opinion that South Africa is going to follow Zimbabwe. We see the same type of collectivist, populist, racial hatred coming from the black communists in South Africa that we had coming from the black communists in Zimbabwe. What that leads to is land grabs. It leads to uh, stealing of foreign assets and of course that leads to economic collapse ultimately probably starvation which already occurred partially in Zimbabwe which is probably going to occur in South Africa so that's what's going on there now of course that's only going to be bullish for the precious metals because there's not going to be any coming out of the ground there compared to what there was in the past and there's a triple whammy going on there in South Africa you've got collapsing metals prices you've got rising along with rising mining costs you've also got the seizure of about five billion dollars worth of assets from those mining companies by zimbabwe and if anything 
uh, if they do anything like what they did with the farms in Zimbabwe, which are lying fallow, most of them, then you're probably going to see that they won't have the technology to mine those mining properties that they've seized from the South African companies. So those mines are going to lie fallow, if you will. And uh, then, of course, we've got this communist government in South Africa, which is just a horrific uh, collectivist operation. So uh, those are three strikes against South Africa. I think that it's going to be a matter of time before it collapses. Uh, one of the crosses that I had looked at for a very, very long time as a fundamental play, one of the reasons I didn't put the play on was because it's very, very hard to find a broker that would do the play. But for me, it would be the ZAR, which is the South African currency versus the Chinese yuan. This is like a cannot lose trade simply because China is going to go up, up and up. And South Africa is going to go down, down, and down. And uh, so there's just no way to lose on that trade. Unfortunately, I didn't put that trade on. I saw that trade back in 2011, but uh, I didn't put the trade on. You can see it would have been a double from that point on. But uh, it's, it's not very difficult to bet on a country that is emerging from horrible communist collectivism to betting on a country that uh, betting against a country that is just sinking in the mire of collectivism and communism. So that's a that's a win win there in my opinion. So back to silver, they're smacking the price down right now. We're gonna wait and see if we can test those lows. We're only about 19 cents away from 1440. We want to watch that very closely. We could get one of those very dramatic spikes even down to say $13 that's going to be a point where you have to back up the truck. And we'll talk to you next time.